today, the subject is Mali. It's scheduled for roughly one month before the Malian presidential elections. But I think as many of you are already aware, um, that is very much in question now, uh, whether the elections are going to take place and sort of what electoral politics, what politics in general, and sort of what, uh, what the political future for Mali is in the very near term and sort of what some of the ramifications for that uh, are going to be. So we have a very distinguished panel who uh, I think they will distinguish themselves further when you realize that we all had sort of things prepared that have since been furiously rewritten. Um, I think I've been talking to uh, most of these people uh, for quite some time uh, over the past couple of days and at quite some volume trying to figure out what's going on and uh, hopefully we can figure this out maybe a little bit more through the talks and through particularly the questions and answers um, and discussion afterwards. Uh, so I'd just like to introduce the panel in general, starting at the north end of the table, is uh, Susanna Wing, who is a professor of political science at Haverford College and works on uh, Malian political parties and electoral democracy in Mali, particularly after uh, sort of 1991 in the Third Republic of Mali. Um, and looking at some of the deeper historical roots, certainly, and how those ideas are mobilized um, in Malian politics, maybe not of today, but certainly of last week. Um, <laughs> next to her, we have Jamie Bleck, who is coming to us as a professor of also political science at the University of Notre Dame in South Bend. And she is, again, a political scientist working in Mali, uh, particularly sort of popular opinions about the state and popular engagement in not just electoral politics, but sort of political uh, discussion and political debate uh, between uh, sort of the everyday citizens and, and sort of the politics of the street and the politics of the courtyard and the politics of the courthouse and the politics of the presidential palace. Um, next to Jamie, we have Professor Mancha Jawara from NYU who may not need any introduction, but he is a well-known author, uh, scholar of art and cinema and literature, a, a filmmaker in his own right. We will be showing his movie, Bamako Sigi Khan, uh, immediately after this, and I believe in this room. Uh, and he will be the moderator for the panel. And next to him is Chekor Traore, who is coming to us from Mali. Uh, after a very arduous trip uh, and somewhat uncertain uh, circumstances of sort of how you can actually uh, get around Mali I I during the coup um, as, it, as it's going on. So we're very glad that he's here. Um, and he is the president of Cosidorai, which is a sort of, uh, union and interest group of railroad workers, both uh, actively employed and actively unemployed. Um, and sort of uh, an advocacy agency, an advocacy group uh, that really sort of challenges some of these uh, neoliberal policies that we've seen be put in place in the Third Republic and particularly under Atete's uh, presidency, Amadou Toumar Touri, the still, I believe, the constitutionally recognized president of Mali. Uh, and particularly, this was, this was a project that uh, came to life in the wake of the 2003 privatization of the Dakar-Niger Railroad. So there's going to be a little bit of Senegalese politics um, as well in this. And we congratulate Senegal on their successful elections yesterday. And so next to uh, Chikura is uh, Mohamed Sek. Who I just met, and it seems like a really wonderful guy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and he will be translating for Chekora. Um, and he is uh, from Senegal. And no. is there anything else you'd like to say? Um, well, I'm here with Jamie, but as a surprise. Great. Well, welcome. Um, my name is Brandon County. I am a uh, historian. Uh, finishing my PhD here at Columbia, teaching at Barnard College, and I work on political history of Mali and Senegal in the 20th century. So I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the panel and on behalf of IES and uh, Global Thought, 
And I think we're going to start with Susanna. I think that, in fact, what I would say, the failure of the politics of consensus and the frustration that arose from this lack of real opposition and the frustration on the part of the people around that um, the reality of the politics of consensus, which was essentially um, to undermine any political dialogue that um, had taken place in the 90s, even though it was very contested, but there was political dialogue in the 90s, and I think that really shifted under ATT. Um, so that would be the first um, point that I would emphasize, is that um, the ramifications of the politics of consensus. Uh, the second point about how Mali got to where we are today in this crisis is, um, is the crisis in the north, and that is um, the combination of the MNLA, the Tuareg rebe rebel rebels who, were, uh, who are con pushing for the independent state um, of Azawad, and that in conjunction with the Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb's activities in the north. Um, a couple points there. One, that um, I see this crisis as being particularly um, pertinent in the sense that in the mid-90s there was what is called the problem of the North. Um, it's often referred to as the problem of the North, which was um, the Tuareg uprising that uh, ended with the, the Flamme de la Paix in 1994. And one of the key components of resolving this conflict was decentralization. It was an agreement to have real decentralization across the state. And what we saw was a shift, well I should say, the creation of over 700 municipalities across the state um, as a response to the fact that in the north those who were um, who the, the Tuareg rebels in the north at the time were aggravated and pushing for uh, increased development in the north and saying uh, that they were sort of had not been included in the state and so decentralization was a logical and important um, response to that. So that's mid 90s. Um, here we are at 2012 and what is the reality of decentralization? Well, um, lack of resources. Um, it hasn't been as effective as um, one would hope. There have been local elections successfully held multiple times, which is a plus, but I think also the municipalities have been bound in some ways by a lack of resources actually reaching um, these, these municipalities. Um, so I would say the failure of um, not complete failure, I don't want to use that word, um, the, the challenges of decentralization and the reality of, of um, the North continuing to be excluded in terms of, of real development um, and the frustrations around that, that combined with, I think, what many people in this room probably know is the reality of Gaddafi's fall and the return of um, Tuareg from Libya armed to the teeth and now able to push for demands and the creation of the MNLA um, as, a, as a response. So, so we have, um, I think if you look at the press now, you see a lot of uh, many comments about the, the humiliation of the military, the frustration of the military in the North who don't have enough, did not have uh, essential food and equipment in order to, to face the, the armed MNLA. Um, and the destabilization of the UN has reported, this is prior to the coup, the UN reported over 200,000 refugees um, or internally displaced persons in Mali, 200,000. So, and that's a direct result of this activity of, of the MNLA. Um, so that crisis was uh, obviously getting worse by day by day and um, making the question of whether or not these elections were actually going to be able to be held efficiently and effectively in the end of April. Um, and the government was adamant that yes, indeed, there would be, without a doubt, presidential elections at the end of April to be combined with a, uh, uh, a constitutional referendum. Um, and, and the government was standing very firm while I think many people were saying, how can this take place effectively across the country when we now have 200,000 refugees? Um, 
So that's the second, the second point. Again, um, and the third about how Molly came to this place, growing frustration with, co with corruption um, is very clear, and I think that um, not everyone is surprised by this coup. Uh, I have some points I wanted to, uh, I'll, I'll share with you from somebody who I have been communicating with who is actually pro-coup uh, and supports this situation. Um, and so, so but, it, but a very widespread uh, frustration with corruption amongst the political class. And finally, the, the general, I would say the general nature of political parties um, in Mali has also contributed to where we are today, and that is that the frustration on the fact that uh, many of these political parties don't really stand for much. They are, they are entities around personalities, right? And, and so what is it, what are citizens voting for when they're not voting for political platforms? They're voting for people who say they stand to, against corruption and they would like to see the, um, they would like to see poverty um, reduced in the country and they would like to see an end to corruption, et cetera. So, so I think the nature of political parties has contributed to precisely where we are today um, in Mali and and a few, um, I, I guess what I'd like to do is share with you some, some comments that have been made to me by, by uh, a contact that I have in Mali who is a, a former judge um, and who has been, who has been, um, who has basically said, here, here are the reasons that I and many others um, are supporting this coup and the sort of the text that we're putting together about what needs to happen now is to first um, negotiate clear conditions between the political class and civil society for a transitional government that has a clear mandate that is very precisely laid out through some sort of legislative organ that will be created and the mandate will be articulated around um, first negotiating the conditions for a return to peace in the north, um, well, throughout the entire country and again, absolutely non-negotiable that this is one country, indivisible, um, and, and that Mali will not uh, let its borders be, be changed. Um, and a complete, um, I should have translated this, uh, um, an assessment of the entire administration, both civil and military, with respect to um, corruption, nepotism, et cetera, and making sure that all the electoral lists are, are clear and fair, and in fact creating the electoral cards um, in the biometric, uh, biometric electoral cards, which there's been a lot of, um, of talk about doing, and then finally proceeding to free, fair, transparent, um, and democratic elections. And I want to say, this is somebody who was very much involved in the 1991 coup and participated in then the transition government and the, the Conférence Nationale, et cetera, who then over time got extremely frustrated with the direction that, um, that politics took under ATT. So um, I think I, I don't want to go any longer, but just to say that those, those are sort of the key places of how we got to where we are and, um, and I think what people are seeing uh, hopefully as, as, uh, as a way forward, and that is um, a transitional government and, and elections being held as soon as possible. The use of my time might be to speak a bit to the Malian population's perception of elections and what elections can actually be. Um, I, I feel like a lot of what we're going to talk about today will not be so much about formal electoral channels as much as informal power and uh, contentious politics. So I just wanted to say a word on elections before they, they get swept off the table and, and complicate elections by offering sort of two contradictory <laughs> statements about them. Um, in Gregory Mann's most recent post on the Malian coup today, he discussed the widespread uh, sentiment of politikimai which essentially means uh, politics are bad, right? So in Mali, usually when we speak of politiki, we're speaking directly of elections and election cycles and candidates. It's sort of this very narrow understanding of political action. And I just, I thought I'd give you some quotes of people that I've been talking to in the last year. Um, the first is a village leader. He's uh, in a village not far from Wolesiabugu, if any of you know where that is. 
about an hour and a half from Bamako. And uh, his, his take on the upcoming sort of Kalatawati, which refers to the electoral campaigning period versus normal time, and how this shapes sort of everyday Malians' relationships with political parties was to say, I thought rather eloquently, we're nothing but fish to them, to the political parties. They come to our village during the campaigns and they cast their nets. Once they reel in their catch, their work is done. So we see a very sort of skeptical take on formal politics here. Um, and the skepticism isn't uncommon. I'll just give you two more quotes from people um, from survey work that I've done with a team of researchers in Mali. Uh, the first is a man from Sakaso, and his, he's about 20 years old, and he said, everything re that's related to politics in Mali is dishonest. It's to fill pockets and to get out. Um, a woman uh, in her 50s living in Mopti, she had a similar sentiment of, I don't like politics, it's nothing more than pure lies. So there are even harsher critiques of the judicial branch where many Malians see laws that cater to the rich and powerful and connected, and the rural voter might be described as detached from these democratic institutions, but the narrative from within Bamako right now I think points to visible corruption in an economic market where who you know in high places determines your job prospects and futures for the sort of the fortunes of your own private enterprise. So despite this skepticism, I think it's extremely important to highlight some enduring aspects of Malian democracy uh, that are threatened by the current coup. Uh, first off, I'd like to say that in doing uh, uh, surveys of a thousand Malians in Timbuktu, Sakaso, Mapti, Kai, Bamako, Malians know the rules of the game. They know their democracy, they own their democracy, they're very proud of it. So when, for instance, we gave a political pop quiz on our survey, 70% of respondents could name executive term limits. I challenge our American population to name executive term limits at such a high, a high rate. But when, when people did it, they did it the same way. They said, you know, San Duru Shantla, five years, two times in a row. And, and this was, I was conducting these surveys in 2009, and this was during Tanja's you know, constitutional coup in Niger. And a lot of Malians boasted, well, compared to that, that could never happen here in Mali. So secondly, I wanted to point out that despite the perceived flaws that I described earlier, elections shouldn't be written off as mere democratic theater. Um, when I was in Mali in January, there was an active debate about the two, 2012 elections um, and there was no agreement about who was gonna win at that time. People were discussing which candidate, maybe not because of the program that they offered, but maybe more based on their sort of personal uh, character, was best placed to deal with the issues of the North, would be the strongest sort of combatant against corruption. Um, so this was a, an important debate that was happening and you know, when going to rural communities, I, I spoke with a lot of people who were defiantly saying, you know, salt and sugar isn't gonna cut it anymore, uh, that, that handouts don't bring sustainable development. So elections are more than just going through the democratic motions, right? They, trigger, they trigger societal reflection um, about what Mali should be and about the mechanisms to make it better. And I'll just leave you with, uh, in doing some exit polling in the 2009 municipal elections, we talked about 450 voters who were coming out of the polls in Bamako, and, and we asked an open-ended question, you know, why did you come out to vote today? And people said, the vast majority said, we'd, they'd done so out of their patriotic duty. So I just wanted to sort of leave those two <laughs> contradictory images of how we imagine formal electoral politics, and we can return to this later, and we can return to more what are people talking about right now, but I thought that's what I'd contribute as an opening. My own approach to this uh, is from the discipline of history. Um, and so I, I want to sort of address, I think, what, what Jamie ended with. Uh, we didn't plan it this way, uh, but it, it, it works well. That uh, why people feel this patriotic duty um, and sort of this sense of patriotism and the sense of uh, sort of a Malian nation uh, and how that's been expressed historically and how the historic expression um, both kind of responds to or, or shows the roots of some of the uh, some of the, the, the roots of the present crisis, um, the even deeper historical roots of the present crisis, and how it provides uh, a sort of political language that's been used throughout the Third Republic, or maybe towards the end of the Third Republic, um, as well as right now um, uh, on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to start out just with the most basic uh, 
reference to the past is the name of the country itself. Uh, is, is Mali referencing this medieval uh, empire in more or less the same region of the country, right? And this is not just uh, so the showmanship of the independence era of 1960, that the idea of Mali as, some, as, as sort of a political entity that's historically rooted, that has a history that goes back well over um, sort of a thousand years or so, is, is, is quite strong. And sort of the best example of this that I could find on the internet this morning, but uh, I've been thinking about this for a while, is um, this cover page for a book by Musa Mara, who is one of the presidential candidates, um, that he has this, this image of Mansa Musa, uh, which if you've seen any image of medieval um, Africa in your elementary school or high school textbooks, uh, this, is, this is sort of the one image that you're going to see. Uh, so it's, yes, it's, it's nice that he can sort of use this picture, his Mansa Musa, Musa Mara, they have the same name. Um, it's certainly a symbol of political power, but a political power over what? Um, that the long history of Mali that is uh, discussed in popular political rhetoric is one of uh, pluralistic states, one that really reaches back to the empires of Ghana, of, of, of Mali, of Songhai, that are, you know, 1,500 years old, 1,000 years old, 500 years old. And more recent uh, political units, uh, the uh, Bamana Empire on, uh, on, on the Niger River, um, some, of the, uh, some of the states resisting French imperial expansion in the 19th and even the early 20th centuries um, are presented as not just states, uh, not just sort of pre-colonial states, but states that um, express their power over a very large territory, that express their power over um, a great deal of time as well, and that were pluralistic, not democratic in the sense of elections um, or even sort of a popular voice in the rule, but uh, states that were very pluralistic, that could do, that did do, sort of what the Republic of Mali has been trying to do for the past 50 years with its nation building project. That is to say, to create a sense of a nation from a large and very diverse population. Uh, what's interesting about uh, Ghana, Mali, Songhai, uh, Segu, and all of these empires, it's really sort of, it's a history that's, that's very well anchored in the south of the country. And the north of the country, as uh, Susanna described, is not just, this is not just a recent phenomenon. This is not just uh, a question of post-independence uh, uh, secession, war, war of secession, or it's or certainly not just a result of what's happened in Libya, is that there isn't the same history of integration uh, that, that, that can include the North. And it's problematic, and people recognize this as problematic, but we see this when, when there's a very rich and well-developed and historically rooted uh, history of political pluralism, of political participation, and of sort of historical legitimacy in the south of the country, that language, that language that's used so often in electoral politics, in speeches, um, in the way that, that, that even sort of national politics is conceived, uh, is, is something that really kind of leaves out the north. Um, we see this, actually, this is sort of a, a Facebook page, or a whatever, group, uh, called Les Sofa de la République, Sa uh, Les Sofa de la République, this is, this is a direct reference to sort of the soldiers of Samri Touré. Right? This is a reference to the, the 19th century. So it's, um, it's interesting. There's, there's, there's some voices here that, uh, like most of, most of what I've heard, no one's really coming out. Um, there's not a lot of people who come out strongly for the coup, but the so Les Sofa de la République is a reference to uh, sort of a, 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 a military group, right, of soldiers themselves. Um, and trying to sort of use this imagery that will allow people to sometimes condemn, sometimes condone uh, the, the, the action of these soldiers today, but sort of have that language almost, uh, have that sort of historical setting that makes it possible to talk about politics as something that's not just happening in the 
immediate present, but something that has uh, sort of a meaning that goes into the past and hopefully that uh, sort of sets up its importance for the long-term future. So you have sort of this and something else I found on that same site. Um, this is one of those uh, posts that is not exactly uh, uh, condoning the coup, but certainly doesn't condemn it, um, and uses this image of Liberté Cigarettes, um, which the name Liberty sort of speaks to all of the greatest aspirations that the, that the, that the CNRDR is trying to appeal to, but also speaks to uh, sort of the legitimacy of the First Republic of Mali, that this is one of the first sort of parastatal uh, factories was to, to make cigarettes and, and matches, uh, Malian made, Malian smoked. Uh, so you see sort of this appeal, uh, not so much, it's, a, it's not so much a question of sort of uh, military coup versus a Republican government, but a, an appeal to an older idea of what Mali is, and one in this case that's very much rooted in the Republican politics of the First Republic, the Republican politics of the 1960s, um, and the Republican politics of, of sort of the independent state of Mali as has existed since 1960. Um, but I think as Dr. Traore is going to explain in a little bit, and I think as, as, as Jamie and Susanna have, have, have mentioned as well, uh, Dr. Black and Dr. Wing, um, that electoral politics and that Republican politics even was not as accessible as it had hoped to be or it, was, or it, it needed to be, as it planned to be. Um, there's still a language within uh, the Republic of Mali and the Republican model to make claims for democracy, right? To make claims for uh, greater political participation uh, in elections, yes, but beyond elections. Um, this is something you might have seen in, in, in some of the images uh, that have shown up on, on TV and on the internet, uh, particularly because yesterday was uh, a national holiday commemorating the end of this period from March 22nd to March 26, 1991, which is a period of sort of a military crackdown on pro-democracy activists um, in Bamako in 91 who were protesting sort of the single party that had grown out of a military dictatorship and that wasn't uh, eager to sort of enact any political reforms to allow sort of a broader uh, participation or a broader series of voice. It's the same, you know, it's the same date, March 22nd. And it's very interesting uh, to see sort of what has been said or what was said yesterday and what wasn't said yesterday in making this connection between uh, Atete, uh, Amadou Toumani Touri's coup of 1991 that was seen as sort of the establishing point of, the, of, of, of Malian democracy today, um, and the fact that there's a military coup that happens exactly uh, 22 years after this uh, sort of bloody crackdown on protesters. So how, how is that being mobilized? This is what hopefully we can talk about a little bit more because um, there's a lot coming out even today from what was going on yesterday. But also how, how do images like this is they're not just important now. They're not just important in the context of the coup. They're also important in the context of non-electoral politics or of economic politics. And this is going to be a, a transition to our fourth speaker who comes from the city of Kai. Uh, this is a similar monument. Uh, the materials are a little bit different. Uh, in the city of Kai, uh, which is a city uh, known for its connection to the railroad, and you see the same image of sort of a woman on her knees with her hands up, sort of beseeching the heavens, what has gone wrong? Uh, and more or less the same language being used. Hommage aux victimes de la concession de chemin de fer de Carniger. This is a monument sort of uh, recognizing the sacrifices and recognizing sort of uh, the, the grave attack against people um, that came from the 2003 privatization or sort of leasing uh, to a private company for a very long time uh, of the National Railroad. Um, this, is, this is the kind of corruption, or at least this is the kind of misplaced priorities um, that you hear talking about today when people are crit criticizing Atate, yes, today after the coup, as well as years before the coup. But you can still use, and people still do use, 
uh, this language of the Third Republic, the language that should be, that, you know, that is so closely tied to Atete, this imagery, uh, this language, is still, very, is still very real and very alive. And um, this, uh, this is what I'm looking for when I watch sort of video and film um, and blog posts uh, from, from Mali today. Um, so now that we're at Kai, I'm going to turn this over to Chekura Traore. I'd also just like to add one thing to his introduction that I forgot earlier. Mm -hmm. If he looks familiar mm -hmm. and you've seen the movie Bamako, uh, he also played Shaka, the uh, main character, uh, pr protagonist in, in Bamako. J'en suis très heureux parce que c'est pour moi une occasion de lever les malentendus. He's very happy because it's an opportunity for, um, to, hmm, I don't know how to put it, but to inform the misinformed, I guess. Uh, en fait, pour revenir au thème, notre conception de ce qui a existé au Mali est que, véritablement, il n'y a pas eu de démocratie au Mali. Qu'est-ce que ça veut dire On a mis en place des outils qui permettent d'asseoir une démocratie, mais ces outils n'ont pas fonctionné. This, this gives us uh, sort of an opportunity uh, here to look at what we had expected, what, what everyone sort of talks about when we talk about Malian uh, democracy, that what should have been in Mali but wasn't, that they had put in place all of the sort of machinery necessary for a democracy, yet it did not come about. Qu'est-ce que ça veut dire? Nous avons rien qu'un parti politique, près de 200 partis politiques. Des associations de la société civile, il y en a plus de 10 000. Les ONG comptent autant. Revenons aux politiques. Est-ce que c'est pour faire de la politique concrète de 100 partis Je me questionne là-dessus. Oui, vas-y. Je peux refaire. So what we have here in Mali or what we had in Mali was 200 political parties. Uh, there's there's 10,000 different non-governmental associations, national non-governmental associations or sort of social civil civil society associations and how many sort of national or international sort of NGOs on the ground. And this is, um, now I've lost my train of thought. Après les, les oui. ONG. Oui, mais je reviens aux partis politiques pour dire right. que 200 partis politiques, right. c'est pas pour faire de la politique à mon avis. Donc, with 200 political parties, how can you have a functioning electoral uh, uh, system based on political parties? Je dois dire que ceci a donné le terreau, les conditions qui ont permis à, au régime de fin d'installer ce qu'ils ont appelé le consensus. And this creates the conditions that allow the uh, people in power to establish a regime known as a regime or a system of consensus politics. Et à mon avis, qui a consisté tout simplement à donner aux acteurs politiques qui sont dans le jeu de pouvoir se servir de leur position pour avoir des moyens que les autres n'ont pas. So, in my reading of this, this is something that allows the people in power to uh, share uh, sort of political power, but also share uh, sort of uh, uh, material wealth with people who are participating in this game uh, to have uh, to, to participate and not sort of, uh, sort of engage uh, in a level of criticism uh, or sort of take the sides of people who don't have a voice in this system. Et ceci a fait que, par exemple, des dérives réelles se sont développées pour détruire ce qui restait de l'économie nationale. Par exemple, Brenton a cité la privatisation du chemin de fer. Mais tout le, 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 le tissu économique est passé par là. Même si les uns et les autres avaient conscience que ce n'était pas une bonne chose. So this is a way that really the national economy has been destroyed 
uh, and he makes reference to the railroad that I had mentioned in, in my talk, um, that so this was a backbone for the national economy. And it was privatized, even though so many people said that this is not a good idea because so much of, sort of what is moved through the country is moved through the railroad. Ceci a permis aussi à chacun qui avait un quartier de pouvoir d'asseoir l'exploitation de cette position-là, c'est-à-dire la corruption, le, toutes sortes d'occasions, en tout cas, de profiter de sa position. So everyone who had their own little neighborhood of power, their own place where they were in charge, they were, uh, they had this opportunity to stay where they were and sit there where they were and manage uh, and, and profit from this. Uh, this is what we call corruption, um, that they're taking advantage of their own sort of local power networks. Ainsi, la, la population à la base voit des choses qui ne sont pas acceptables du point de vue de la loi et de la décence, mais ceci est couvert par le manteau de la de l'impunité et ça fait que les populations se disent on ne peut plus rien faire contre ça parce que mm -hmm. il y a eu des exemples qui ont montré que des choses très graves ont été faites mais les auteurs n'en ont pas subi le moindre préjudice. So people were perfectly aware of what was going on and saw what was happening and knew that it was it wasn't right and that it was illegal but they also saw that the people who were carrying this carrying out uh, these activities who were involved in this corruption were covered with sort of a cloak of, uh, of invincibility and that they couldn't bring sort of the power of law or power of the state to act against them. Je ne veux pas dire que tout le monde s'est couché, c'est pas juste. I don't want to say that everyone's, everyone's acting in these ways, that's, that's, that's not fair. Mais ceux qui se dressent et qui veulent lutter contre cela sont aussi l'objet de ces vices. Arbitraire. But those people who sort of see what's going on and uh, organize uh, in opposition to it and speak out against it are caught up uh, in, the, in the vice of the system uh, that, that is uh, acting, uh, that, that sort of comes down on them. Ceci est vrai pour ce qu'on appelle la classe politique, mais aussi dans la société civile dans les syndicats, comme tout simplement dans la population, il y a des gens qui ont tenu la sentinelle pour défendre les valeurs qui sont celles de la République et de notre euh, peuple. So there are people in the political class, there are people in civil society, there are people in, in the trade unions who do see their role and do act in this role uh, as defending the values of, of the Republic and of the, of the political system as it should be. Mais il faut dire comme on voit au résultat, un coup d'État qui est vraiment une impasse, ça veut dire que ces forces n'ont pas pu influencer les affaires du public. So when we see uh, sort of a coup d'État like we have just seen, and we arrive at the impasse that we've arrived at, this is proving that these civil society forces do not actually, or these civil society actors do not have the uh, force or the authority Uh, that, that they should. Et malheureusement, ces forces sont affaiblies rien que par le fait que la règle est plutôt l'accompagnement du prince du jour que d'être intègre et de défendre des valeurs qui servent tout le monde. Mm -hmm. So, one of the reasons, the reason why uh, these civil society um, actors, these actors for the republic, Uh, have been so weak is because they recognize that the rules of the game uh, really uh, are uh, with and decided by uh, the people in power at the moment. Je voudrais dire quelque chose par rapport à la situation du Nord. And I want to say something now about the situation in the North. Ma perception de cette situation, c'est que c'est une, une, un aspect fragile de la société qui est exploité à chaque fois que l'occasion se présente pour les acteurs différents, des différents moments. So this is a situation that is very delicate um, and has been, and it's, and it's something that is exploited throughout the recent history 
by political actors when they uh, feel the need uh, to exploit it. L'un des arguments le plus souvent usité est que le nord est arriéré et plus arriéré que le reste du pays. One of the most commonly used arguments is that the north is not just backwards, that it is the most backwards uh, region of the country. Pour moi, ça c'est de la poudre aux yeux. Parce que quand on va dans d'autres secteurs, on voit de vrais problèmes de développement qui ne sont pas moins graves qu'au nord. Mais les moyens utilisés pour défendre leur droit à la, au changement de, de conditions de vie n'est pas l'arme. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's just sort of a smoke screen, that there are other regions of the country that are um, just as equally far from from development or sort of far from, from power. Uh, and they don't use the same, uh, the same political language. They don't make the same arguments uh, by, by military force, and they don't succeed. En fait, quand on regarde les moyens qui ont été amenés au nord, if you look at the at the at the money that's that's been sent to the north, le peu que je sais, c'est que rien que l'exemple de la coopération Mali-Libye a été fondamentalement ancré sur le nord. And that this long history of uh, cooperation between uh, Mali and Libya is fundamentally uh, anchored in the question of the north. Et la sécheresse des années 70 a été utilisée pour justement mettre des moyens spécifiques au nord, soi-disant pour renouveler le cheptel de Chameau. Mm -hmm. So, during the drought of the 1970s, that this relationship was used to send uh, material resources to the north to uh, relieve some of the problems, particularly through the market of um, livestock, and particularly camels. Je ne connais pas de secteur au Mali qui ait bénéficié d'autant de moyens à compter de cette période. There is no other uh, sector in, in Mali that benefited as much during this period than the North. Rien que la société libyo-malienne qui a été créée au début, euh, pendant les années 70, a amené régulièrement au minimum 15 milliards de, 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 de francs maliens mm -hmm. pour and cette fin, exclusivement pour le Nord. And the Malio-Libyan Society um, partnership uh, spent 15 million uh, Malian francs per year. Milliards. Um, milliards, sorry. 15 billion, yes, uh, Malian francs per year on this uh, sort of, uh, livestock scheme and other development projects in the North. Et de ce moment à aujourd'hui, ce chiffre ne s'est pas dédié, s'il ne s'est pas conforté. And the books aren't balanced still to today. Mais chaque fois, c'est plus de pression pour qu'on ait plus d'argent. But every time that there's a problem, there's sort of this pressure on the state um, for more, uh, more materials. Alors donc, uh, moi, pour moi, c'est purement et simplement de la spéculation so sur des sensibilités, on dit c'est des minorités, et sur le recul par rapport au développement. So for me, this is pure and simple sort of political speculation on the sort of place of minority populations uh, in, in, in the country and of, sort of their role and their experience with uh, development projects. Euh, la question de l'intervention en Libye a posé une acuité de cette question par and le fait que le régime de fin a laissé entrer les, 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 les ressortissants de la Libye ou des Maliens qui étaient en Libye avec force d'armes et de munitions. And the fall of uh, Qaddafi's government in Libya has brought us to a head once again now that we see a number of Malians returning from Libya uh, with uh, arms. Nous, notre perception de cela par rapport, disons, de la part de, 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 des dirigeants du régime, c'est que c'est de la trahison. So, our uh, sort of view of this uh, with regards to the state is uh, this is a, an issue of treason. 
Parce que le président de la République du Mali d'antan n'ignore pas ce que c'est que des armes en tant que personne qui a fait une carrière militaire. Et la Libye n'est pas n'a pas de frontière commune avec le Mali. So the president of Mali being a former soldier uh, should be aware of arms coming into his country, particularly from Libya which doesn't share a border with Mali. Alors il y a des pays qui étaient plus en contact avec la Libye qui ont refusé que ces gens rentrent chez eux et pourquoi est-ce que c'est le Mali qui doit les les, les réunir avec tous les honneurs qu'il faut? Mm -hmm. So there are other countries that, that are closer to Libya that have uh, refused uh, so these, these uh, people coming back from the Libyan conflict. And yet in Mali, they come back uh, and are welcomed sort of with open arms. Et puis cette question aujourd'hui, disons, a été gérée de la façon la plus tendancieuse qui soit. And then this is managed in an absolutely uh, uh, mismanaged fashion. Je vous remercie. En attendant des questions. Thank you. Uh, I wait for your questions. I'm supposed to be a moderator, but I was asked to, to make a statement. So I wrote about two pages uh, comment in, in an attempt to put uh, Mali in a kind of global context. Uh, much of what I'm going to be saying has been said, but sometimes there is a virtue to repetition uh, if for no other reason, uh, then uh, for, for uh, uh, retention. I, I think I want to begin with uh, especially the, the, the presentation on the Mali Empire, Ghana Empire. Uh, I want to remind you of a song by Salif Keita uh, called Ijo Fama, mm -hmm. you know, you are right, king. Uh, and, and the song basically goes on to praise the kings of Mali, you know, the Tiramakan Traores, the Sunjata Keitas, with us, the Jawaras of Kingi. Say, so you're right, you're right. But today, the time when we used to stop, uh, arrest other powerful men has passed. You know, you can rest on your laurels of kings. But that time has passed. Uh, Mansa Mina Donte Bie. It's a Ijo, Ijo Fama. I don't know if you know that song. Yeah, yeah. So it praises you, brings up your, your pride and all of this, but they say, but time has passed. You know? So you are right, but the time has passed. Now, work is what counts. You work, uh, work is what counts, and uh, uh, consensus is what counts, and so on. And I think that song is very important for our time, actually. Uh, it's a Salif Keita song, and it's called Ijo Fama. Uh, so I think it goes also uh, with your presentation on, you know, because this whole pride thing has to go. Uh, so let me read quickly uh, my editorial on uh, my polemic or diatribes. Uh, the criminal and chaotic situation in Mali today is a direct result of NATO's intervention in Libya to overthrow Gaddafi. In the wake of the Arab Spring, many of us were in favor of removing Muammar Gaddafi from power to open another door to the winds of democracy blowing in the region. Most importantly, we wanted to see an end to the humanitarian disaster provoked by the regime in Tripoli by throwing uh, boatfuls of African immigrants to the sea and to stop the impending massacre of the population of ben Benghazi threatened by the narco-leptic dictator. At that time, President Obama and Sarkozy, with the help of France's own media savvy intellectual Bernard Ari Levy, known as BHL, has concocted a narrative well packaged for our consumption in which the Libyan strongman uh, like Saddam Hussein and Hitler was described as capable of committing unprecedented crimes against humanity and the National Transitional Council as only motivated by the passion for democracy. Thus, the invasion of Libya was clinically executed from the air by NATO planes 
to the greatest relief of the majority of the United Nations members and all those who believe that a democratic change in the Arab world in general and Libya in particular will safeguard the world against terrorism, gender inequality, anti-Semitism, and racism against blacks. Today I'm now writing about these cliches, racist and Islamophobic sound bites that are often embedded in narratives whose true motives trump democracy and humanitarian concerns for cold neoliberal economic plans. How else would one explain the situation of poor Mali, defenseless with its archaic tanks and machine guns pitted against the soldiers of the former Gaddafi army and their sophisticated weaponry. As the Malian army retreats, the rebel army moves in one town after another, cutting the throats of soldiers and civilian populations, destroying everything in their way and creating panic among the population of Gao and Timbuktu, which lie ahead of them. More than 200 thousand civilians have fled these towns and nomadic settlements to, see, to seek refuge in neighboring countries such as Mauritania, Burkina Faso, Algeria, and Niger. The population of Agil Haq, Gundam, and Tesalit in northern Mali have suffered the horrific crimes that NATO forces had prevented Gaddafi forces from committing in Benghazi. Additionally, northern Mali, after the fall of Timbuktu and Gao, will soon become an unchallenged hub, heaven for radical Islamist groups such as ACMI, uh, which is a branch of Al-Qaeda, and Sardin, which is another Islamic group, all intent on imposing the Sharia law from Algeria to Mali, Mauritania, Niger, Nigeria, Chad, and Sudan. Another major threat to the region is the drug trade transiting in the Sahara Desert, desert on its way to Spain, France, and Italy. The defeat of the Mal Malian army in the north has created national discontent with a weakened and humiliated regime in Bamako that was considered by many as one of the beacons of democracy in West Africa. President Amadou Toumani Touré, or uh, known as ATT, has now been exposed as a weak leader, always seeking consensus and never acting decisively to combat corruption or to draw the line on how far he was willing to give in to the demands of the Tuaregs in the north. Atete was also accused of undermining the democratic institution by always caving in to the demands of demagogic, demagogic religious leaders who were opposed in the name of Islam and tradition to the constitutional amendment by, for equality between men and women. Faced with this general discontent, wounded pride and anger directed at the president, a junta made up of junior officers ha has seized power, like bank robbers taking advantage of a blackout to put their plan into execution. The coup seems more ironic not to say ridiculous, given that on the one hand, the disarray in Bamako, the capital city, sends a strong signal to the rebels that they are winning the war. On the other hand, the presidential election are only one month away, and Atete had reached the end of his last term in office. As, ha as hard as it is to take a coup d'etat seriously nowadays in Africa, even in Africa, the silence of Obama, Sarkozy, and Bea Shell over Gaddafi's former soldiers in northern Mali, side by side with members of Al-Qaeda, Acme and Sardine, and narco traffickers seems even more unfathomable to me. The fact that Gaddafi's former intelligence chief, Abdallah al-Senussi, some of you have seen in the news, uh, was recently arrested with a Malian passport in Mauritania is an indication that NATO and the Libyan National Transitional Council did not complete the job in Libya. They just deterritorialized it and made it the problem for Mali today, and soon for Niger, Mauritania, uh, and Nigeria. It is a déjà vu of another American and NATO botched job. 
with which we're all familiar. Some would even say that it is the logic of neoliberalism, follow the money and don't get bogged down with moral imperatives. Now, with the coup d'etat in full gear and the radical religious groups in control of the North, the, useful, uh, the usual suspects are lining up with the condemnation of the coup, the desire for a peaceful negotiation of the conflict in the North and the return to constitutional order in Mali. We're familiar with this narrative too from the UN, the US, the EU, and the AU. Likewise, no one will be surprised if they fell on deaf ears among the junta in Bamako and the Qaeda and ACME in the North. The population in Bamako and elsewhere are in shock and the only reaction so far has been to take cover and protect their properties, cars and goods from the soldiers turned looters. It is clear therefore that the Malians discontent with the democratically elected president is not matched by a show of support for the coup makers. In fact, it has been hard for many Malians who had thought that the country had gone past an army takeover of power to wake up for the last three days, five days now, and find that the country has regressed more than 20 years back. So I dare predict the imminent collapse of this coup like the end of a nightmare that people have awoken from. By next week, if civil servants in Mali stay at home and refuse to collaborate with the junta, and if the neighboring country shut their doors to members and emissaries of the imposters, then I do not think that it would last long. On the contrary, as I see them retreating to their barracks soon after they have finished looting public and private properties. As for the northern question, and, and this is really the most contentious one, and uh, I will take exceptions uh, with my colleague, uh, Chekura Traore, uh, because when you travel in Africa, uh, as I have done it, you, know, you go from Algeria, you go to Burkina Faso, you go to Niger, Nigeria, all the way to Cameroon, you see young Tuareg kids begging in the streets. Ghana, anywhere you go. So there must be a failure of something. No matter how much money is spent, maybe the money is not being spent well, I don't know. But personally, I feel very bad when I see young Tuaregs begging street corners everywhere in Africa. And they say, where are you from? They say, I'm from Mali. You know, and they're begging. So there, there is something wrong, and this has been 50 years, and has been like that. So that the Tuareg question is important. Uh, yes, I agree with you, money has been put in there, but uh, maybe something needs to be done, whatever that is. Uh, we, that's what we need to think seriously about. Because when you ask Malians from the South, they will basically say, well, they're lazy, they don't work. Now, that's what white people say about us. They say we're lazy, we don't work, and now we're saying that to the Tuaregs. So we need to look at it more seriously, because, I mean, you know, I'm from the South, but this is what they say. And uh, I'll stop here, because other people didn't go too long, so i just stop here. Thank you. Okay. Let me just make it clear for those people who are not familiar with ECOWAS. It's the West African Regional Economic Association. And the meeting today, and I think it's the most important meeting. Mm -hmm. The outcome of the meeting, if they are, they will condemn the coup anyway. So if they condemn mm -hmm. it you know, softly, that's one signal. If they condemn it firmly, these people are gone. Mm -hmm. So it depends on what they're going to say, because in a week or two, they will have no money to pay the civil servants. Mm -hmm. Uh, in a week. You know, this was uh, in Le Monde today and other places. The uh, problem about this is not about expertise, it's about reading Twitter and yeah. the news. <laughs> so I don't know what to say. If I can just follow up on that, that I, I think absolutely that one of the things that this junta is facing is the complete isolation. I mean, everybody has come out against it. And what I had read prior to the ECOWAS meeting was talk of. Um, 
I mean, how forceful a response will this be? Will will this even be? I mean, I, I've read. Would this even be a military response? I don't. I don't know. One thing I think is interesting that I also read is that the the MNLA, the Mouvement National Libération d'Azouad, that's the Tuareg group, has said um, immediately post the coup, yeah. they don't want to negotiate <laughs> with these coup people. They want to negotiate with a legitimate government that's internationally recognized. So. You know, there any progress that might be made in terms of actually um, talking, <laughs> having some sort of dialogue to resolve this crisis is, you know, that that and clearly the coup uh, leaders are are talking. I it's purely about force. It is about it is about the securitization through force of the north, and 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 so I'll just leave it at that. Que ce soit ce qu'on appelle ECOWAS, que ce soit un État qui est dans un rapport bilatéral avec le Mali. Ils ont le droit de défendre les grands principes. Mais ce qui est vrai aujourd'hui pour le Mali et son peuple, c'est que nous sommes dans une situation critique dans laquelle il n'y a pas de lieu pour l'hésitation. Et le régime qui est tombé a montré les limites de sa compétence. Ça, je ne voudrais pas perdre tergiverser dessus. Aujourd'hui, essayer de bloquer les affaires, la, la, le fonctionnement des affaires internes pour sauver ATT, pour, je ne sais pas moi, les deux mois à venir, peut se faire. Mais ce serait créer une situation humanitaire grave. Ça, je le dis. Pourquoi Allez, vas-y. OK. Um, to, to sum up a little bit um, in, in, in English, uh, that, that it's, it's a question for ECOWAS and it's a question for bilateral agreements that certainly, yes, other countries and, and regional institutions have their own interests in, in uh, sort of the political future of Mali. But the question is also, uh, there's, there's a very important question to, to ask about what the results of this will be in Mali itself, that, that, there's, that there's a threat of a very serious uh, humanitarian crisis to, that, that is on the heels of this political crisis that we're now uh, living through. La réalité est que le euh, défunt, euh, comment on appelle ça, régime, a fait fi de la réalité, euh, comment vais-je dire, euh, qui, a, qui consiste à la famine qui s'est installée depuis la saison de pluie dernière. Ça n'a pas été le souci de ce régime-là. Ça, c'est un. So, first of all, the now defunct uh, government of Atete uh, has not been concerned with the uh, with with sort of what has gone since what has gone on in the environment um, and in the country uh, as far as uh, the politics of drought and famine since the last uh, uh, rainy season or last planting season. Sans compter que, en plus de cela, il y a la situation du Nord qui a été mal gérée. And of course, the situation in the North is very poorly managed. La troisième question, c'est que il y a euh, une réalité qui consiste au fait que dans le pays, on n'a pas créé les conditions du fonctionnement de l'école, de la santé, du travail. Pratiquement, le pays est corrompu entièrement. And the third, uh, the third issue is that the state itself is not functioning correctly. That, that the schools, that sort of the way that, that, that work and, and, and sort of the labor market is, is, is managed, it's all sort of rotten from the core, that the state does not work. Et moi, je sais le sentiment que le Malien moyen a. And, and I know what the average Malian uh, sort of thinks about this. Mais, donc, les pressions de l'extérieur peuvent s'exercer, mais les Maliens Je peux dire au moins à 60% n'accepte pas so, que ce soit dicté de l'extérieur. So the, the foreign uh, interests can certainly say what they have to say, but it's also very true that um, that a majority of Malians, perhaps 60%, are not going to accept uh, terms being dictated from outside of the country. Et donc là, je vois un bras de fer s'installer. Et je ne suis pas sûr que la communauté internationale en sortira grandi. 
So I'm, I'm worried about a very sort of uh, heavy-handed response being uh, developed uh, outside of the country and that this is not going to help uh, democracy return to Mali. Il y a déjà des forces qui s'organisent sur le terrain. And, and there's already so, uh, forces gathering. For me, they indicate more the failure of nation state in Africa. Mali is not exceptional in this. In every single statement here, Mali is no worse than Burkina Faso, than Niger, than Senegal, than many of these places. They, you know, the nation state, they're very poor. I just said, if the if U.S. cuts the aid, uh, France cuts the cooperation, the aid, they, they will not be able to pay for the salaries in Mali or Burkina or any of these places. So Mali is not exceptional at all. It seems to me, therefore, that we should focus on the criminality of the, uh, the junta that brought about this. The, mm -hmm. the, the, I don't think democracy is really what is on trial here. You know, I think to, to, yeah. to criticize democracy or to criticize outsiders for intervening is one way of supporting the coup d'etat, in, in my opinion, mm -hmm. here. Because I don't see Mali had a, a better situation in, democratically. Senegalese actually invited ATT now. I never received anything from ATT. I don't have anything <laughs> to do with ATT. NYU pays my salary. I'm very <laughs> independent. Now, so don't take me. So ATT, his consensus, you said it very clearly, uh, was a problem. The people did not think that he was a strong man. But even that is coming from this Malian character of being a man. You know, you got to do this. You got to be decisive. Mm -hmm. More than an accusation of democracy for me. So, you know, to put democracy on trial or to put, uh, to make Mali exceptional really doesn't work much for me in understanding the crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so. Things are evolving so fast, it's hard to get a sense of, I mean, as, as it's been said before, this is in part a state building issue. And these are complicated, really difficult questions. And I think it is essential that the voice come from the Malian people and also the diaspora being part of that. This is minor and maybe not as good as like what you could bring to a protest, but I think that the diaspora has played an amazing role on the Twitter and Facebook and, and Skyping and has facilitated communication about what's going on in different places. I mean, that's certainly who I've turned to to get my information. And it, yeah. I mean, it seems minor, but I, I think that flow of information coming from those voices and not just international press reports have really helped flesh out um, the story of what's going on. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think nation states, with the exception of places like Nigeria, which we all know is chaotic, nation states are not that viable in Africa, really. They're so small and so fragile. Uh, the diaspora, in my opinion, and I've been writing about this, the best investment of their politics and time is to link up with the African-American community here mm -hmm. and have the African-American community fight for them in D.C. with the Black Lobby and the Friends of Mali. Mm -hmm. But to wait for a coup and suddenly, they don't have the money to lobby in Washington. I mean, Nigeria can do that. A regional community can do it. Or African Americans. But really, yes, I feel really sorry for Mali now. But uh, if things had gone wrong in Senegal, we'd be talking the same way. Things almost went wrong. Mm -hmm. so, it's because these nations are so fragile. You know, they're so weak. Uh, they just put them there so they can vote in the United Nations and with France or with the Soviet Union. I don't think we're viable. <laughs> That's why when we talk about the northern question, it's not just the northern question. It's, it's Mali, Mali mm -hmm. as a whole. You know, and I'm 100% Malian. Speak three languages of Mali, so, but I don't think it's viable unless we do something with our neighbors. And we're not gonna do that, so we'll be there forever. We need to, the Mali need to be with Senegal, Guinea, they speak mm -hmm. the same languages. And when he said that, they think you're crazy. Because frankly, there haven't been too many uh, sudden and tragic opportunities uh, to make a, 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 a political statement like that in the past mm -hmm. 20 years. One of the reasons why the Malian diaspora is so large here is that it's fairly easy um, 
and making money. With, that's greatly qualified, but it's fairly easy to move between Mali and the United States, uh, two very friendly nations. Um, and I don't, and I don't think, um, unlike some other countries, certainly um, th there's not a network of political refugees in the diaspora here as, as there might be from other places. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that there is a great deal of political legitimacy that can be drawn from the connections that are made um, outside of Mali as well. Because Mali is not just a territorial entity, that, that this is what that long history is. And this is what, in, in response uh, briefly to sort of your counsel to move away from uh, Mansa Musa and other kings, yeah, that, but I think that's what's going on. It's not, it's not Ijo Fama, it's mm -hmm. I, I, Ijo, Ijo, Ijo Faso Demo. Uh, <laughs> that, that the history of pluralism is becoming a democratic history that's being told, mm -hmm. and one that's being told around the world. Mm -hmm.